I want you to imagine it's finals week. Summer break is almost here and you're almost finished with your last final. You've been working on your English paper for the last four days and you're almost done. You're an hour from the deadline and you finally finished editing and polishing your perfect paper and it's ready to be submitted in Blackboard. Before you press the submit button, something goes wrong with your PC and this is what you see, the blue screen of death. If only you'd invested in a Mac. PCs are much more likely to encounter technical issues and viruses than Mac computers, according to PC World and Business Insider. Hi guys, I'm gonna be talking to you about persuasive speaking today. And before all you PC people start hating me and writing mean comments under the video, uh, that was just an example of how you could open uh, your persuasive speech by using fear appeal and emotion to engage the readers or the listeners and to get them to understand what that situation might feel like. I do own three PCs and one Mac, so um, I, I actually don't have a bias, but we are going to be talking about uh, persuasive speaking. Now this is a great video you can watch. It's a student, a college student, and he talks about gay marriage in America. He actually uses a lot of the same components that you're going to use for your persuasive speech. They're very popular elements in many persuasive speeches. He opens with impact and visualization, like I gave you guys with the Mac PC example. He addresses some common misconceptions about his speech or about the topic, and he also uses fear appeal and emotional appeal in a powerful way to make his audience feel something. So if you have time, go ahead and watch about five minutes of that speech to take note of those three things. During this lecture, I'll be breaking down the main areas of the persuasive speech. That is the introduction, uh, which includes your open with impact, your main points, and you'll have th three main points in your speech like you normally do, except this time main point one is going to be something called inoculation, main point two will be a graph, and main point three will be fear appeal. We'll also go over your closing and some tips for success. And don't worry if you didn't understand what I was talking about with main points one, two, and three, I will go over those. So your basics. It's worth 100 points. It's five to seven minutes. You need to dress professionally for your speech. Make sure you hand in your formal typed outline on speech day if you are one of my face-to-face -face students. If you are one of my online students, you either are about to submit your outline online or you have already done that and you're about to submit your persuasive speech video. So make sure that you do turn in that outline. It's very important. Also, you will have a six slide PowerPoint presentation or Prezi or Google Slides, whatever is um, accessible to you, to aid your speech. And just make sure that it is downloaded um, on the computer in the classroom for us so that we can uh, present your speech or also, if you are my online students, download it on, in Blackboard so that I can see what your PowerPoint slides look like. This is a more rigid structure than the informative speech, so pay very careful attention to all the details within it. For the organization, as I stated, you will have three basic parts and you will also have three main points. For the introduction, you will have your open with impact, a thesis, and a preview. For the body of your speech, you'll have three main points, which are the inoculation or misconceptions, a graph, and fear appeal. And then for your conclusion, you will use what's called a call to action. Now when you start out, you will use an open with impact, and you will use visualization. For your last speech, you were required to ask the class a few questions and or have them represent a statistic. For this speech, you are required to start out with visualization, like I did with the Mac PC uh, opener that I used earlier. So for this, it must be descriptive visual content. It should create an emotional response for the audience, and the goal is to put them into that experience so they really understand what that must feel like in order to be persuaded immediately. It should create motivation and the urgency to act. Here's a rather sad example, and your speech does not have to be sad. It should be very impactful, but you can draw a, um, a sad picture or a positive picture of what will happen if we make changes in our life. So you can persuade people using either or. This example, uh, this student, this is what it would sound like if this was um, a speech I was giving to you guys. 
I want you all to imagine you're sitting in a chair next to an old metal bed. You see a figure that's not familiar anymore. It's your grandfather, holding on to his last moments of life. He'd always enjoyed smoking on occasion, but you never expected this. You're there with him as his struggle stops and he slowly gives up his battle. This is the story of the day I lost my beloved grandfather to smoking. Every year, there are, there are 485,000 smoking deaths, which is 20% more than road accidents, poisoning and overdose, murder, suicide, and HIV combined, according to smokingfacts.gov. That is your open with impact and your opening statistic. So that is what you would do for your speech. If you were the girl giving this speech, you would start with this as your imagery. This would not be your very first slide. This is just for lecture purposes. You would uh, press the B key so that it will be a black slide. For my online students, you can do this whatever way uh, suits you best. For my face-to-face -face students, this is um, very specifically for you. So you will start with your imagery, and then your first slide will actually be this slide or something similar, which might, it'll be a statistic or a fact and a picture. Um, this is kind of an ominous picture, and that's fine for persuasive speeches because you are, you are allowed to use fear appeal as long as it is real fear appeal and not manipulation. So th these are some actual statistics, and smoking does cause death. So this would be a suitable opening statistics slide. So you'll notice for this open with impact, for this visualization, it was descriptive, it was visual, it created an emotional response from the audience. You should speak it seriously and um, slowly enough so that it really soaks in, uh, sinks in with the audience. The goal is to put your audience into that experience and to create the urgency to act. Now with the opening um, slide here, you will have a statistic or fact and a picture and you present this after the imagery. I just wanted to ask you guys, and I know you can't actually answer me, but just think to yourself, which visual do you think would be most effective at persuading your audience to quit smoking? So just think about that for a second. Now I'll tell you what I personally think is uh, correct. So the black lungs, those would be most effective. If you are going the fear appeal route, the emotional appeal route like uh, we've been talking about, those black lungs, um, that is the scariest thing a smoker could see, and that is something that would really persuade them to stop smoking. Now, I am not pushing graphic, disgusting images on you guys, so if you would like to do something a little less scary or graphic, I would say possibly the person just smoking a cigarette, or the person with the cough. You also don't want to end up with that smoker's cough. What I wouldn't choose is the no smoking sign only because we are so accustomed to seeing that that it probably wouldn't register as anything negative or positive and definitely not the happy cigarette because that might get a laugh from your audience and hurt the tone of your speech. Moving on to the first main point of your speech. This is what we call inoculation. This is where you address the common misconceptions regarding your topic. It shows that you're credible, trustworthy, and informed about the opposing side when you do it the correct way. An example here in a speech about why Apple computers are better than PCs, uh, you know, if you were going to give this as a speaker, you might say something in your inoculation slide that goes like this. I know you might be thinking MacBooks are ridiculously overpriced, but the reality is that even though MacBooks might cost four times the price of your average PC, they last around three to four times longer and remain virus-free, according to blank. Be sure to add your sources, especially in a topic as controversial as Macs versus PCs. I know it's kind of funny, but you should see some of the people in the audience who get heated when people deliver these types of persuasive speeches. You must cite plenty of credible sources so that they are believing you at least somewhat or respecting your opinion. So make sure you cite those sources. This is just one example of how you could use inoculation. Now, why we use inoculation or misconceptions as a main point is because everyone in the audience is going to have a different opinion. 
And if you only address one side of the issue, it's going to frustrate the audience. So inoculation shows both sides, and it's the most effective type of persuasion. It helps you to appear unbiased and informed because you have facts about both sides, making you a more credible speaker. It also increases the persuasiveness of the argument. Lastly, the audience will now be resistant to more future counterarguments because they know both sides of the story. They have facts for both sides. This is an example of how you would lay out your inoculation slide. I gave you an example of how you might state part of this slide orally. This is how you would lay it out. For our particular class, this is what's required. You must have one column on the left, which are your myths or misconceptions, things that people don't understand or mistakenly believe. And then on the right, these are your facts. This is the research that you found to set your audience straight. So this, for this um, particular slide, you would say, I know you guys are thinking that guns are kept in locked cabinets and unloaded, but the reality is that 48% of guns are left loaded and easily accessed. I, I also know you're probably thinking that most guns purchased by criminals um, are purchased by criminals illegally. However, in the book Gun Control by James Smith, it said that 53% of guns used were purchased legally. So you would go on like this, going back and forth, and something that a lot of students choose to do is they set up their inoculation so that everything comes up one at a time. So if you really want them to focus in on one of your points while you're talking about it and elaborating on it, please do elaborate on these points so you spend a good minute, minute and a half on your inoculation slide. Remember that time balance. Um, so while you're elaborating, you may want to keep the, um, the computer focused on just one point. So you can, you, know, you can pull it up one at a time so that it makes it easier for the audience to um, really tune in to what you want them to. That's about the most animation you should ever have for a slide presentation, though. Moving on to your second main point. This is your graph. This is where you provide evidence and statistics to persuade your audience. You can use maps or diagrams. I've seen people use diagrams of the United States colored in different ways to represent a certain number of people. Um, or, you know, I've seen a lot of childhood obesity or obesity in America demonstrated on graphs of the U.S. with different colors showing where it's the highest. You can also, um, let's see, use pie charts like this one here. The point is that your graph needs to help further strengthen your argument. It should not just be something that is informational. This graph is just for fun, things you can never look cool doing. I thought you guys might get a kick out of that, but I'll show you some actual graphs you could use in your persuasive speech in the next slide. During your speech, use one graph. If you really, really want a second graph, go ahead and do that. I have had students really just say, I need this second graph. They're both so great. They both make my point. Go for it. I would suggest laying them out on two separate slides, though, unless you need to draw a comparison so that it doesn't get too cluttered. While you're speaking, it is so important to point to and explain the significant parts of your graph during the presentation. We can't take in maybe 10 bars of a bar graph during the minute and a half where we're also trying to listen to you explain it. So make sure that you point out the significant parts that you want us to remember because we can't take all that in at once. Um, discuss other research and or examples also while you're discussing your graph. I do understand you probably can't talk about some of the significant things in that graph for a minute or a minute and a half. You're probably going to need to expand into other related areas. So that's fine too. Keep your time balance in mind. Again, with each of your main points, they should be a minute or a minute and a half to have that proper balance in a five to seven minute speech. So for your inoculation, expand on those points. For your graph, expand on those points. And then lastly, we'll move into fear appeal, which is just a picture. That's, that's what that last main point is. And again, a minute, minute and a half, expand on that picture. So on the graph side, make sure it's limited text. You can still use three subpoints to support your main point. Those will just be written on your note cards. They will not be written on the graph. Mostly what will be on the graph slide is the key, the X and Y axis will be labeled, and of course the graph will most likely have a label on it. So that's ba the basics of what will be on your um, graph slide. I wanted to have you guys think about this. 
which graph would persuade you to quit smoking? And whichever graph you think would be most effective, that is probably the graph you would want to use in a speech where you are persuading your audience to quit smoking. So hopefully you've come up with an answer yet and looked through some of the information. If you notice, um, so, so let's say you decided this one on the right here, smokers as a percentage of adult population. I surprisingly have a lot of people say, or a lot of students say that would, that's what they would put in their persuasive speech. But when I look at it, I say, okay, so lots of people smoke in different countries. Great. And the U.S. is actually pretty low. All right. Nothing to worry about. Okay, cool. All right. That's not very persuasive. In fact, it's kind of comforting that we're not doing, you know, we're okay. We're doing okay. Um, and also, but really, it's just purely informative. So people in the U.S. smoke. Okay, great. Now, if you look at the graph on the left, you've got causes of death in the United States. Look at this. Oh, my goodness. All the way to the right, smoking is so high. That's ridiculous. That's the highest cause of death in the United States. Look at the others. Alcohol, motor vehicles, of course, AIDS over there on the left. Fires, homicide, illicit drugs, suicide, and smoking is just off the charts. So that is the graph you would want to pick. And you don't have to address each of those bars. Just really focus in on the smoking. And maybe focus in on something small like motor vehicles. People are so concerned about crashes. But look how small that is compared to smoking. So you might want to draw some comparisons there with some extra research and statistics while you're focusing in on that graph during your speech. Your last main point is your fear appeal slide. This is where you use pathos or emotional appeal to make your audience feel. You won't be using many, if any, statistics. So your fear appeal, the key here is that it cannot be manipulative and it needs to be realistic and relevant. I've had students in the past, and I know they were trying their very best, and maybe I needed to hit harder on this, but they gave speeches about why you need, or you know, trying to persuade people that, to get a college degree. And in their fear appeal slide, they had a picture of a homeless guy, or they had pictures of homeless people. And they said, without a college degree, you will end up homeless and die on the streets. That is a little bit drastic, and also made the audience laugh, because it is so far-fetched. And everyone knows a lot of people without a college degree who have not ended up homeless and died on the streets. A better example would be without a college degree, you might not be able to provide for your family the way you had always planned. That's something most people have thought about. That's something that people who either almost didn't get their degree or are still working on their degree, that's something that goes through their mind. And it's something that's right there within reach. So that's a much better example of fear appeal. And I even put this picture of this woman here because I think that would be a fitting fear appeal picture without being graphic. Uh, and just being realistic. So make sure that you have real pictures like this. It helps the audience relate to your topic and understand the consequences. It can be a stock photo of a hypothetical realistic story with details like this woman. It can be a news story, especially if you're giving a speech on why you shouldn't drink and drive or why you shouldn't text and drive. Maybe there was an accident on your street. Maybe there weren't any fatalities. Maybe there were but, you know, in your town, and you can show that picture and say, you know, this, this happened, you know, on my street. This is happening all around us. So that really hits home. It's very relevant when you do things like that. Or it can be a personal photo. Maybe you yourself got into an accident. Um, also keep in mind your time balance. So again, a minute, minute and a half spent on this main point. The reason I keep hitting so hard on that is because every time I see people give, or not every time, but for some reason, during the persuasive speech, they end up being really short. They're supposed to be five to seven minutes, and sometimes they end up being just around three minutes long. And I think it's because people rely on the PowerPoints too much. And when there's not very much text on the inoculation slide, on the graph slide, on the fear appeal slide, when you're just relying on images, people kind of choke and they just move on. So make sure that you've got all the information you need on your note card so that you can spend a substantial amount of time on each of these main points. Lastly, for your fear appeal slide, it should be very limited text. Really, it should just be a picture, or it can be two pictures, three pictures. Don't overdo it. I'd say three pictures max. This is an example of a good fear appeal slide. If you don't want to do something graphic, which is absolutely fine by me, 
Um, you know, this could be childhood obesity. You're talking about maybe your niece, your daughter, your little sister. You don't want this to happen to her because her eating habits are so bad just because that's what America has come to these days. And you could tell a detailed story about that. You could also throw in some facts, statistic, and research to back it up. But make sure you tell that detailed story to get the audience to feel something, to get them to feel emotion and possibly even fear, kind of like we did with those two opening examples about the computers and about um, why you should not smoke. Another example here are the little kids at McDonald's. Again, fast food. Maybe your speech is why you shouldn't eat fast food. Clearly, it's not good for children. What are we doing to them? What are we setting them up for? These are the type of things you can hit on. And again, back it up with more research and examples and facts and statistics. This is not a good example of a fear appeal slide. I've had, I've seen these pictures in people's actual PowerPoint presentations and they have evoked laughter from the audience. That's not what you want. It doesn't match the tone of your speech if it's a serious speech. This, both these little guys, they look really happy. So it doesn't cause you any concern. They're smiling. And then this last one is a cartoon. So that one's not realistic. And then the other ones, um, they aren't, they don't, evoke any fear or any sort of emotion. Lastly, your conclusion. This is where you use a call to action. There are a lot of different concluding tactics you can use for a persuasive speech, but for this speech, you're going to either use foot in the door or door in the face. This is where you encourage the audience to act and you will actually get a raise of hands after asking the audience two closing questions. Please remember to ask both questions. Sometimes people forget that. So for your foot in the door, this is one of your options. This is where you make a small request followed by a large request. An example might be if you were giving a speech about why you need to get a college degree, an example for your closing could be, who here will make a promise to me right now that you will continue through school and get an associate's degree? If you're willing to do that, who here would also be willing to take it one step further and get their bachelor's degree? So you see what we did there. For the foot in the door, you get your foot in the door by asking just a small request. And then, since they've already agreed to that small request, they've kind of mentally taken that step. When you ask for that larger request, it doesn't seem so large anymore. So that's how you use the foot in the door technique. The other one is the door in the face. And this is where you make a large request followed by a smaller request. The example here, if you are giving a speech about um, why you should you know, choose a Mac over a PC, your closing could be, raise your hand if you will make an Apple computer your next computer. If that's too much to ask, please raise your hand if you'll at least consider it after hearing this speech. So there, you asked for a large request. If you have PC people in the audience, they want their PCs, you know, vice versa. So when you ask them to make an Apple computer, their next computer, they are going to say absolutely not. But if you downgrade it a little bit, if you make it much more manageable in comparison to this large request, it seems like you're hardly asking for anything at all. So then if you say at least consider it after hearing my speech, they're usually willing to go with that. So these are two different techniques you can use to get the audience to agree to act at the end of your speech. And please do get that raise of hands. Raise your own hand while you're asking to kind of indicate what you want them to do. Because I'm telling you, it really does help you feel like you gave a really um, impactful and important speech when you get that action at the very end. Just a little note here, the reason we use foot in the door and door in the face tactics, it's based on something called cognitive dissonance, which a lot of speech textbooks or communication textbooks talk about, as well as psychology textbooks. And for me, I've just always found this interesting. You don't necessarily need to know it for an exam or anything, but to get you to understand it, people, they need their beliefs and their behaviors to agree. So if you did your job as a persuasive speaker, the audience members will feel that they need to actively support you based on these new beliefs because it's very uncomfortable when they don't match up. This is why the speech structure works in this way to get that action at the end. This is a student's example of their own foot in the door uh, slide. So this student said, by a show of hands, how many of you now agree that wearing seatbelts is important? 
And of course, people say, well, you know, I've listened to your seven minute speech and you made some really good points. So they raise their hands. Then he followed up by saying, if you agree to that, will you pledge to wear your seatbelt while driving or riding in a vehicle today and ask your passengers to buckle up this week as well? And then, of course, they're going to raise their hands. Um, some might not, but, you know, you will get some people who say, you know what, yes, I can take it one step further. And that feels great as a speaker to feel like you actually made an impact. Your success as a persuasive speaker is determined by your content, your delivery, and, of course, all of that leads to, you know, awesome speaker credibility. So as far as your speaker content, be sure that you have great message and argument quality. You also need to be sure that you have the number of sources and qualifications that you are required to have. For this speech, you must have at least three scholarly, credible sources. If you want to have some extra sources that aren't quite as credible but are still good, that's fine. But start out with those three great scholarly sources. As far as your delivery goes, make sure that you're dynamic. Be passionate, but don't be angry. I have had speakers get the two confused. And when they give their persuasive speech, they sound particularly angry, and all it does is offend the audience. So be friendly with, with your um, listeners and have that passion, but a passion that will make them passionate too. Make sure you're trustworthy and that the audience can relate to you and you've related to them. And then show that you're competent. You know your stuff, you're knowledgeable, and you are fluid as you delivered your speech. Lastly, this is your very last slide, some reminders. It does not have to be a sad speech. I've had people give speeches about why we need to protect the environment, why we should recycle, like why we should get a Mac over a PC or why we should get a PC over a Mac. I've had people give speeches about why we need to be fit, why we shouldn't eat fast food. Um, I could go on and on, but there are plenty that are not necessarily sad speeches. Just be sure that as you present your speech, it is professional, convincing, that you approach the topic in a serious way and be sure that it fits within the speech format. That's one of the biggest problems I see when people decide to not do your standard fear appeal sad speech. Please still follow the requirements for the speech. And if you need help with that, I can help you. Um, but be sure that you're still following the requirements. And then for your speech format, just one more quick reminder. You'll have an open with impact, which is a visualization followed by your first slide, which will be your statistic. Then you'll have a thesis and preview, followed by each of your main points, your inoculation, your graph, and your fear appeal. And then you'll have your conclusion, which is your call to action. That's your foot in the door or door in the face technique, whichever one you want to do. Um, you are not required to restate your three main points this time. In your previous speeches, you've been required to restate your three main points and then have a closing statement. For this speech, your closing will be that call to action and the raise of hands, and then you'll say thank you. If you want more information about all this, if you need a reminder about what inoculation is, what that graph slide needs to have, what the fear appeal is, if you want extra information about this, look in Blackboard, Canvas, or in the email I sent you, depending on what school you're from. There are some overviews in there for you, some sample outlines, sample PowerPoint slides, for you to look at, play around with, and get a feel for everything. Lastly, practice many, many times out loud and in front of people. I say that for each and every one of your speeches because that is the best way to really know if you are presenting your speech well, and it's the best way to learn how to handle your nerves so that when you get up in front of the crowd, those nerves are not going to stop you, and you'll feel really confident about the information you want to present. Hope this helps you guys, and email me, as always, if you have any questions or need anything at all. I'll talk to you later.